So welcome everyone. You're probably here to either learn more about creating a continuous delivery pipeline or to see me suffer for 50 minutes creating one. Uh, the first part of the suffering already started because we had some issues at the beginning, so let's hope the rest goes flawless. Um, so my name is Johan Janssen. If you want to contact me, feel free to contact me if you have any questions or any remarks. For the next 15 minutes, this is more or less the outline. So we start with why would you build something like this? Then I'm going to work hard and you can relax. Uh, and we go to a conclusion and questions. If you have any short questions in, in between, please feel free to ask them immediately and I'll try to answer them uh, directly. You don't have to wait until the end unless it's a long question because I don't know how many time we have left. It's a bit packed session uh, and I have to work a lot. So in the beginning, we had waterfall projects. Uh, probably you're all familiar with the term. Later, we went to more agile uh, projects where we were basically created smaller features which were available uh, quicker, uh, which is a nice improvement because it makes an iterative process where you create new features uh, as, as a sort of a stream uh, and you can release those features uh, to the public. Unfortunately, in theory, uh, it meant that lots of new features were implemented but only deployed to production like once or twice a year. So it, it looks a bit like this, we build lots of cars and then we put them on a shelf. And there are some disadvantages to putting stuff on a shelf. You don't make money off it and you don't have happy customers. So basically to solve that problem, uh, Agile is like a first step of creating small features and making sure customers can use them and continuous delivery is like the second step to make sure those features don't keep laying on a shelf. So we start doing continuous delivery which is basically like a step further than continuous integration, which was already popular before it. And so let's get our hands dirty and uh, go to build something. So what are we going to build? Basically, we as developers, uh, can be a boy, can be a girl, whatever, um, are building an application and that application goes through a pipeline where uh, some steps are being performed and then the application is delivered to our end users who are then, of course, really happy with the new features that they have. Um, and I'm going to live build an application pipeline uh, to do that. Uh, I built almost everything from scratch, except for these three things, because, yeah, it's on a conference Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi in general, so I cannot really trust the internet, so I'm working offline, and therefore I cached some things, such as the Docker images, which are just the plain images, so not the configuration, I will do the configuration live. I cache the Maven dependencies because, yeah, Maven leads a lot of dependencies and over the internet uh, Wi-Fi is probably not a good idea. And for the OWASP dependency check, which checks um, my Maven dependencies for known vulnerabilities, they have really huge uh, reports of a couple of gigabytes. I don't want to download them live, so I cache them as well. Um, one other thing which is interesting, I use Docker and Docker Compose. Uh, I won't tell too much about it, so if you're interested in it, uh, look it up on the internet. I can probably fill a session with it easily. Um, but one thing which probably is, is good to know before I start is um, how with Docker Compose we can create our own network uh, and internal in that network we can easily reach different applications. So if you look at the top, like the cloud is the Docker Compose network. And in the Docker Compose network, I have a Sarnacube Docker container running. And if I want to go to that uh, Docker container from my host machine, I can go to it with either using localhost or my IP address, and then the so-called external port of my Docker container. Uh, below in the container where Jenkins tries to access Sarnacube, it's both within the same Docker Compose network. So then I can use the internal um, name, so the name of the Docker Compose container and the internal port name. So you cannot mix them, you have to be careful with that. Uh, so how does it look like? Basically I have one external um, a part and that's my machine where I deliver the code and the configuration. All the rest is running in a Docker Compose network and can connect to each other with the Docker Compose naming. Um, so what are we going to build? Basically the first step when we make code is to put it in a version control system so that we can easily work with it with a team, we can revert changes and everything. Uh, in my case I use GitLab as an example for version control. Uh, 
In step two, we will add a GitLab a Git hook so that if, we, if I do a push to GitLab, then it's automatically triggering a Jenkins job, and Jenkins will uh, download the code from GitHub and build everything. After that, Jenkins in step three will call Sonicube to do static code analysis, uh, to search for known vulnerabilities. Uh, if that's all okay, then uh, we will deploy the artifact to Nexus, our artifact repository, so our jar file, war file, etc. we can store it there. Uh, then as a next step, we create uh, a Docker image. So our application is a Spring Boot application. We put it in a Docker image, and then we start the Docker image, and it becomes a container. And that container is depicted over here. So basically, Spring Boot is running in, a, in Tomcat in a Docker container, and that will happen in step six. And in step seven, we will use Gatling, uh, which can be used to do performance testing to see if our application is responding quickly. So this I'm going to try to build in the next 44 minutes. So quickly start with building. Um, let's quickly show, uh, oh, I see that I didn't open everything. So let's quickly open two more files. So this is my Docker Compose file, which basically starts all my different services, like GitLab and Jenkins, sorry. Oh, yes, sorry, good remark. Let's make sure you can see something. Uh, let's see, where are we? Okay, that's better. And now you can see it. So this is my Docker Compose file where I define all my services. So my GitLab, my Jenkins, etc. And here you can see what I mean with ports. Uh, let's pick a more uh, a port I, which I've shown before. So this basically is the internal port inside my Docker container. And Sonicube by default starts on port 9000. My external port is port 8104. I can just pick a random port for that. So if I'm within my Docker Compose network, I can reach the Sonicube instance by going to Sonicube uh, port 9000 instead of going to localhost port 8104. So lots of configuration here, but let's uh, not focus on that one and go to uh, my readme. So everything you're going to see uh, is also on my GitHub web, web page. I will later show you the link to it. So you can follow the same manual as I'm doing now. Um, and so basically I did a bit of configuration to make sure Docker has enough CPUs and memory. Uh, and I started everything. So the next step I, uh, is basically to make sure that I use my local Maven uh, registry. Therefore I need to configure my settings.xml, but I already did that up front. So we begin by creating an application. I create a Spring REST application, really simple application. You can follow the guide on start.spring.io, but because I don't have internet, I simply uh, have the code over here. So I have a, a, a short greeting class which I will use. Uh, let's put it in here. Uh, make sure something runs here. So I've got a greeting class. Uh, nope. Copy in, and I've got a REST endpoint which uses the greeting class. Oh. I've got a mouse that's easier. Um, if it works. So we have the greeting controller, which is uh, our REST endpoint, which basically gives a greeting and it has a counter which counts how many times it's being called already. Um, let's make sure it's a bit bigger so you can see something. Uh, so this is my code basically, and I can start my application Uh, so the REST endpoint is greeting, uh, and it returns uh, a greeting with the counter and basically the name. So let's see, where's my browser? Uh, so 
hello world is being displayed, I can F5 and I can see that the counter is going up. So this is just a simple REST application. Uh, I can supply it the name, uh, and then it says hello Johan. So really fancy application. This application is be, be, being used basically as uh, our starting point and we will deploy this application through the pipeline. Uh, therefore, we start basically by creating a, a GitLab a project uh, to store our application in it. Um, then one, two, three. Sign in. So I can create a new project. Let's make the font a bit smaller, test app. Uh, I make it public so basically everyone can use it and I create a project. Then already GitLab gives me all the information um, how to add my existing, uh, existing code folder to uh, this GitLab uh, project. So I'll simply execute these things in a terminal. Uh, rid of that. Let's see if it is in here now. And so now my code is in here. So I have my first version in uh, repository control. Uh, so basically, step one is being accomplished. And now it's up for the next step. Configuring uh, Jenkins. To configure Jenkins, uh, it automatically generates a password which you can either retrieve in all the logging output of Docker Compose or you execute this command, which is way shorter. So let's execute this and make it a little bit bigger because now I cannot see it. We got the one time password, uh, or you can even uh, use it forever if you want, but it's a bit difficult to remember. Uh, we go to Jenkins, supply the difficult password. Uh, I don't want to save it because it's different if I create a new Jenkins instance. It takes a bit of a while because it tries to make an internet connection and I don't have an internet connection and I don't need it. Uh, but it tries uh, for a few seconds if it can get it up and running. And after that we can follow the rest of the wizard. Um, so by default I installed some plugins uh, already through the Docker setup. So I don't need to install any plugins now, and I can basically continue for now. Uh, start using Jenkins. One thing I do want to change is the password because it's way too difficult. Uh, let's see what password did I use for it? Uh, admin. So first we change the password, admin, and then we do some extra configuration. When I started using uh, Jenkins for this talk, they didn't have a Java 11 image available that was working with the continuous delivery pipeline. So basically I used Jenkins on Java 8 and I installed Java 11 next to it so I can use Java 11. I noticed that nowadays they apparently have an issue, a new Docker image which includes Java 11 and the working pipeline. So uh, you should be able to uh, get a bit of a simpler setup. But with my setup, you can see how you can configure some manual stuff. So I still uh, like to include that. So we will add Java 11 manually. Um, uh, Java 11 was the name, I believe. Let's see here. Uh, so we have Java 11 and we supply the directory where it's being installed. So I automatically installed it um, with Docker already. The same goes for Maven, I already installed that as well. Uh, so I don't want to install it automatically. I want to use the directory where it's already installed. Uh, save. Um, I want to configure the global security as well because for now I don't care too much about security. That's basically a different talk. So we prevent uh, cross-site request forgery exploits. We disable it for now because it enables me to quicker create my pipeline and I can add security later, but that's a bit of outside of the scope of this uh, demonstration. And then the next step is basically to create a continuous delivery pipeline. So the 
the pipeline here, which Jenkins will use basically to control everything. So my Jenkins is basically the center part and it will call all the other applications. And to do that, we create a new item. We can call it pipeline or whatever we want. It's of the type pipeline. We say okay. Um, I don't want to allow concurrent builds because that's always a bit tricky. Um, and I want to remo remove all builds because I don't want to keep all the version history. And I don't know how many of you use, use Jenkins or have used Jenkins in the past. Uh, how many have used Jenkins files already? Okay, not so many. So maybe that's good to explain. So normally within Jenkins you have the GUI and there you configure everything, every step, every Maven action that you want to do. Uh, but if somebody else changes it, it's a bit hard to track. Nowadays they have the so-called principle of Jenkins files and the Jenkins files control uh, contains all the configuration for my job and it is stored in a Git repository. So it's basically under version control. And in our case we will store it in the same Git repository as our application. So I will simply say pipeline script from SCM, uh, from Git, and then I enter the repository URL, let's see, at this one. So th this way if somebody changes it and you're like, oh, what happened here, you can simply see in version control who messed up your deployment scripts or improved them. Okay, so we have a pipeline ready. So the next step is basically to make sure that if I push something to GitLab, that GitLab will automatically trigger the Jenkins job. To do that, we have to do uh, one thing which is fairly new in GitLab, which wasn't necessary before, and that's that we have to specify in the admin configuration that we want to allow outbound requests, so that we want to able GitLab to trigger Jenkins. It's a bit silly because in the next step we will say that we want to do it, but I need to uh, specifically put the, uh, this to enabled. And this is new in GitLab, so in the older versions this wasn't the case, so it depends a bit on which version you're using. So next step will be that we will call the Jenkins URL of our project, so you can see here the name pipeline, that's the name of our project, and we will call that from within uh, our application in GitLab. And to do that, we go to integrations in GitLab, we specify the URL, uh, we disable SSL for now, and we add the webhook. And now we will simply create a basic Jenkins file, so this is instead of configuring Jenkins through the GUI for a job, we will simply use this, this file. And all this file does is basically it uses the Java 11 that I just configured within Jenkins and it will do a Maven package. Um, and it, it's really simple, it's just uh, a Jenkins file. Uh, so you create a normal file and call it Jenkins uh, file. Uh, just text. Um, so one thing you have to keep in mind is don't call it Jenkins file dot text or, or something because it won't find it. It's specifically looking for the file Jenkins file. So don't name it something else. And now yeah, we have to basically push it so it goes to git. Um, of course you will supply a really good commit message, but I'm a bit in a hurry. Commit. Let's see, I think it didn't push it. Uh, now let's see if our, uh, so you see I did nothing, uh, I didn't trigger any build in Jenkins, but it's automatically starting because I created the integration between uh, GitLab and Jenkins. So it's automatically being triggered. I get a n nice overview of the continuous delivery pipeline, so all the different steps, in this case it's a really simple step because I only do a Maven package. So let's not wait for this to finish and go to the next step, and that's to configure Sonicube. So to configure Sonicube, we go to the Sonicube URL, um, we log in, 
and we say that we want to generate a token, and this token is being used by Jenkins to connect to the Sonarcube server. We continue, we say that we want to use Java with Maven, and I shouldn't forget to copy paste this. Oh. Like this. Copy, yeah, that's a good one, but I only need like the last part. But thanks for the tip. And so let's put this part in the uh, Jenkins file. Uh, and see what we have to do next. We're going to add Sarnacube to the Jenkins file. So every step we configure in the Jenkins file. And this time we have some extra stuff like environment. Oh. So we removed the old stages because that's way too simple. It was just an example, oh, not the plain text. Um, and in environment, you can basically specify variables. And in this case, I specify the Sarnacube token as a variable. Uh, remove this one. And now I have a few different steps. So I can make as many steps as I want. So I do a Maven clean. I run Jacoco to do all the unit testing. And then I run Sarnacube. And I supply uh, the environment uh, variable that I use, the Sarnacube login token. So these are the different steps. Um, yeah, of course, I still need to add it. And push it. So let's have a view at Jenkins again. So we can see the previous build, it's completed, build one. And it completed all three steps. It did a Maven package in the end. So our application is being packaged. Now you can see I get extra steps. For instance, unit test with coverage. So the names that you see here are the exact same names as the ones uh, that I use in my stage names. So if you pick nice names for it and you, you don't put everything in one stage, you can clearly see what's happening in your pipeline. And you can also see how long each step takes and you can optimize some steps if they take too, long, too much time. Uh, we come back to Sonicube in a second because it takes a little while to complete. Uh, next step is something which you often see in, in, in projects is that you want to have a relation between your code and your version control system and the stuff you deploy on production. So if there is a bug on production, you know which code you have to check out from version control and fix your bug. Traditionally, with for instance the Maven release plugin, if you do a Maven release, it will create an artifact which you can deploy on production and the Maven release plugin will add a tag to your version control system. Uh, however, within, with Jenkins files and the continuous delivery pipeline, that's a bit of an issue, because if it creates the tag, it automatically triggers a new Jenkins job. So basically, you have an endless loop of jobs. And one other thing I don't really like is that you have all the tags. So your version uh, in Git is a bit, your Git history is a bit polluted. So I used a bit of a different approach, and that is that in the name of the artifact, I include the git commit hash. So that way I have a relation between git and my artifact without having to do commits into, uh, into git with version information. So to do that we need to make some co configurations in our pom.xml. Uh, first of course we want to use snapshots. And I have to specify the name in my build section. Yeah, whatever. And so the name of my artifact will be the name of the artifact, then the version that I have, so in my case 001, and then uh, the git commit hash. Um, for that we need to configure a few plugins as well. Let's add them. And again, you can, uh, if you have more time, read it uh, later what the exact specification of it is. Um, so these are two plugins basically to retrieve the git commit ID and add it to my artifact. Uh, now I'm going to configure Nexus so that if I uh, make a new version of my application, it will be deployed to Nexus. Uh, to do that, I basically configure Nexus in my POM. Oh. 
So I add distribution management. So if I now do a Maven release, it will be released to the Nexus um, on this location. And therefore, again, I need to add a stage to my Jenkins file. So basically, every time you add something, you do some steps, and then you add it to the Jenkins file to make sure that those steps are being triggered by Jenkins. So we go back to the Jenkins file. After the Sonar Cube ana analysis is ready, we want to make sure that Maven uh, does an installation and a deploy. And the deploy will make sure that it's being deployed into Nexus. So let's make sure this is uh, all being pushed. And in the meantime, we can see that the previous analysis worked, so I have a Sonar Cube analysis. So if I look at the Sonic Cube project, we have the demo project here. There is one code smell. Um, basically, it doesn't like the, uh, the static final uh, because it should be in basically other characters in the uh, uppercase font. Uh, so this is a really simple one. Sonic Cube can also detect some more serious issues. So until now, we've added uh, the Sonic Cube step and the step to deploy to Nexus is currently running. Uh, let's see how far that one is. And so we can see it's running a Sonicube analysis and it's uploading the artifact. Uh, not outputting anything yet. So let's see if I can show you the git commit hash that's being uploaded. So here we can see that, um, I think I removed a bit too, no, it's, it's correct. I uploaded version 001 and then the git commit hash and the test app name is not in front of it because uh, that's the way it's being stored within Nexus. So within Nexus I can now retrieve my artifact as well. Um, of course, reload it, whatever. Uh, so we can browse our releases and look for the demo project. Uh, it now includes a lot because I didn't uh, clean it up in f uh, before this session. But if I look at the Maven uh, metadata, I can see that the latest version was B6.7. And B6.7 was, if everything went correct, also the version that was created here. Uh, so this is also B6.7. So this is the latest version of my application being deployed to Nexus. And so basically we finished step four and we can go to step five to add some Docker configuration to it. Uh, therefore we first create a Docker file. So basically we use a Java 11 image uh, as the base uh, to create our Docker file and we add our Spring Boot application um, to the Docker image. Um, again, it's, it's Docker file, so not dockerfile.txt or anything. Make sure that the naming is correct. And we'll simply add this. And as a next step, again, of course, we need to configure something in the Jenkins file. And this time we configure uh, a few things. First, we add some ports. Uh, so the Docker registry port, Docker registry is basically like um, a Git repository, but then for Docker images. So it's a place to store our Docker images and it's stored in diffs, so it doesn't uh, need too much disk space. The second configuration is the application port, and that's simply the, the port where our application that we created, the Hello World application, will be running on. Um, again, for this step, we need to retrieve the commit ID because also for the Docker image, I use the git commit hash uh, as the name for my version uh, of the application. So I retrieve the commit ID and then I create Docker images with docker build minus t and I give the image two names or two tags basically, a latest tag and a commit ID tag which I then can later uh, use to deploy. I push those two to the Docker registry 
And then what I do is I stop the application. So if there is no application, of course, the first run, it doesn't have to stop an anything. But the second run, there is already a Docker container running, and I want to stop it. And then I want to start a new application on the application port that I specified with the specific git commit ID. Then I do one last trick on the last line, and that is that I add the Docker container with my Hello World application, I add it to the existing Docker Compose network, so that again I can use the internal names of the Docker Compose network instead of going to my IP address or my local host or something like that. So it's a bit of a trick. Uh, so let's add that to our Jenkins file. At the end. Um, yeah, of course I have to commit it because else it won't do much. Sorry? Uh, the Docker file isn't being committed. Let's let's check that. Uh, project. You're right, it isn't being committed. I didn't select it. Uh, indeed, I was too quickly. And now it, it isn't pushed, I believe. Okay, let's do that manually as well. Thanks for the remark. So we will not wait for it, it takes a little while. So in the meantime, I will configure Gatling. So Gatling is being used to do performance testing. Um, whom, whom of you have used Gatling before? Someone who has used JMeter? Really, if you've used JMeter, I've used JMeter in the past as well. I liked it back then, but it's quite complicated. And Gatling is a lot easier. It uses a Scala DSO, but basically you don't really notice that it's Scala. But uh, I will show an example uh, after I did the configuration. Um, so I have to add the Gatling dependency to my pom. Just put it somewhere. And I have to configure the Gatling plugin. You can do that here. And then I can create a Gatling test. And I, it's a Scala test, so I put it in a different directory named source test Scala Gatling. So let's create that directory. Uh, so source test, and here we create a new directory, uh, Scala Gatling. We can mark it as test if we want, and we click apply, okay. And now I have a new directory, Scala Gatling, and I can create a new file. Uh, in this case, I call it basic simulation dot Scala. Um, yes, before I forget it again. And this is my test. So I'll copy paste it and then explain how it works. So basically what I do here is I define a scenario which I can give any name that I want. I say how many times I want to repeat it. So basically it's a loop being executed three times. And within the loop, uh, it will do uh, a, a get request to my URL, and it will check if the status is 200. And between each request, it will pause for 10 milliseconds. So it's a fairly simple loop, just to have a world check uh, with some load on it. At the bottom, you can see that I say ramp users during 20 seconds. What that means is that at zero seconds, I have like zero users. After 10 seconds, I have around 500 users. And after 20 seconds, I have around 1,000 users. So those 1,000 users will execute the loop three times. And that's basically my performance test for now. And at the end, I make sure that every call is successful and else this build step will fail. So this is Scala, but the DSL is that simple that you don't really notice that it's Scala. You simply need a little bit of information. It's clearly documented on the website. So if you do performance testing, I can highly recommend this. Um, uh, first time I used it, it, yeah, it just easily worked instead of JMeter where I uh, had some hurdles to take before it worked correctly. Um, of course, as the last step, we need to make sure that 
the Gatling test is being executed by adding it to our Jenkins file. And make sure everything is in here. Yes. And everything is pushed. Uh, let's see. If everything worked before, then uh, we should now have a running application. So one build failed. That was because uh, I forgot to include the Docker file, so thanks for mentioning that. And uh, this build succeeded, build five. So let's see if uh, we have a running application. And uh, yes, we have a running application. Uh, so it simply returns uh, hello world for me. Uh, so this is my application which is running. Um, so you can basically view it from different views. So this is the standard view. There is also the blue ocean view. And the blue ocean view is like really fancy. So you can see the different builds. You can click on one. You can see in which stage it's in. It's in. It looks really fancy. So if you want to convince your manager to use this, maybe this is an idea. Um, and this basically is the new UI of Jenkins. So in a while, the complete Jenkins will look like this. And this is the first part which they migrated basically. Um, if you don't like it, for now, you can still use the old one uh, by going back. Um, and so we have our application running, and I can also, if I now, uh, it's continuous delivery, so if I want to change my application, that's also possible. Um, so if I want to change my greeting controller, and for instance, instead of um, name, I say name plus um, whatever we want, J prime. And we can again commit this. That's being pushed as well. Uh, so let's see, performance analysis is still running. So maybe a short recap. So what we did in the last few steps was from within Jenkins, we create a Docker image. From that Docker image, we create a running Docker container. The, that's basically step six. The running Docker container contains Spring Boot, which is running in a Tomcat uh, container. Um, and in step seven and eight, we basically use Gatling to do a performance test to see if our application is performing uh, as we wish. Uh, we can see the performance analysis, it, it finished. And, um, it, so it, it also shows the statistics here. So the, this is the performance statistic about the mean response time. We only did one run, so I can only see one result for now. Uh, but normally you would get a line. You can also watch the more detailed information by watching the basic simulation reports. Uh, let's do that in a new window. And this is really nice. I mean, with JMeter, you get some results and you need to use Excel or something to create nice graphs out of it. Gatling does it out of the box. So what I see here is like um, my average response times, my max response time. My max response time is really high because I immediately start the performance test after my application is started. But it's not completely started at that point. So I should include a sleep between starting the application and doing the performance test, then it works better. Um, and I can, even, I can even see that. So I can see that the response times are actually going down. So that means that in the beginning, they still have some issues, and later uh, the performance is better. So you can see all kinds of statistics that you want uh, are in global. Way too much information, basically, about the number of requests, the number of requests that failed, which were okay or not okay, um, how many requests executed within a certain time period. Uh, so it's really, uh, you get this out of the box, the, the complete report, which, which is really nice, if you ask me. Um, so my last deployment. It's also finished, so if I go to the application now, I should get a different result. Yeah, so now I get hello world J prime, and you can see that the counter is 3001, and that's because my performance test did 3000 requests to the website, and I did one. So this way, I can create my de continuous delivery pipeline.
so are we finished now with building everything? Uh, not completely. Uh, probably you want to add some security. Probably you, you will do SSL between the different applications or to connect to the application. Uh, but it differs a bit between uh, companies, what the policy is. Um, and it requires me more than 50 minutes to set up. And uh, something else that you probably want is that if SonarCube will detect an issue, you probably want to build to stop. Or if Gatling detects an issue, that can be easily added, but you need a few more minutes to accomplish that. Uh, but I would really uh, recommend doing that because now I will also deploy something to production which contains basically bugs. So that's not something you want. Um, so for me, as a conclusion, I think continuous delivery helps everyone. It helps developers because you get quicker feedback on your code. So if something is wrong, you still know, okay, I was working on it just a few minutes ago, so I just need to change this and then it will work again. It will help the business because they can quickly see how everything is looking, if it's according to their plan. And it helps users because they will receive their features much more quicker like every week or maybe every day or with Facebook thousands of times a day. Um, I, I don't recommend trying it thousand times a day if you have a small company because it doesn't add that much. Uh, I would aim for like once a week or once every two weeks when you have a decent feature to commit. And for me, yet like doing this, it's not really rocket science. It's something you can do incremental. So you start building with it, and building the pipeline is something which is you can do in a continuous delivery way as well. You start simply with Jenkins and GitLab, and then later you add SonarCube, you add Gatling, and you keep adding on extra stuff. So in my repository, I also have examples um, on how you can add the OWASP dependency check plugin, which checks for security vulnerabilities of your dependencies. Uh, I have an example which uses PyTest, and PyTest can be used as mutation testing framework to see if you have written proper unit tests. Um, and you can add that incrementally. You don't have to do that at once. If you say to your manager like, yeah, I need, I need two months to build a continuous delivery pipeline, he will probably say no. If you say, like, I need two days to set it up, it's probably fine. And then the next week you say, okay, I want to add this. It takes, like, half a day, and that's probably fine as well. And you can keep incrementally improving that. Uh, so that's something that I would really uh, recommend. Don't try to build it at once. Uh, because new interesting tools pop up every day. Uh, um, new security tools that will automatically st check stuff. So if something new and interesting pops up, I simply add it to my existing pipeline. Um, nowadays, stuff like usability plugins and, and things like that, they uh, become more and more popular. Simply add everything to your pipeline that you, that you need. Um, so if you want to try this yourself or want to read back uh, what I did, uh, it's all in my GitHub account. Um, if you Google for GitHub and Johan Janssen, you will find it. I don't have that many re repositories. So um, Again, if you have any questions, you can tweet me or email me. And I think we have some time left for a question. Are there any questions? Then I would, oh, I see a hand, yeah. Uh, as containers. Uh, so the question is, what's the benefit of having things like Jenkins and uh, GitLab uh, as containers? Um, one of the benefits is that you're cool. Nowadays you need to do everything with containers, of course, but that's not, not the proper one. I think for me the biggest benefit is that um, if I deploy this stuff on, on my machine or on a server and it burns down, I can roll out immediately a new version. And if I install all the software manually, then it takes way more time to do it manually. Of course, you could use Chef or Puppet or something else to automate that process, but I'm more used to uh, Docker. I find it easier to use than tools like Chef and Puppet because they have their own DSL, uh, and I always have problems with that. So that's the reason, basically, to quickly be able to roll out uh, to another place or to the same place, um, and, and Docker can help me with that. Um, and I would say thank you all for joining me and have a nice day. <laughs>